Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to uh, the people listening to this uh, webinar. A warm welcome on behalf of myself and of uh, Sora Plaza. My name is uh, Stefano Kruku. I'm a project manager at Sora Plaza, responsible for our solar asset management events. And I'll be uh, doing a big part of the moderating today. Um, I said good morning, afternoon, evening. We have uh, around 100 people joining at this point from all over the world. So very glad you're with us. Um, before we start, I go to the next slides. Always important to mention uh, any questions, either to me, my colleague, us as the organizers, um, or to the, the speakers later on, feel free to uh, type these in the, on the right-hand side in the chat box. And I'll be addressing these questions when there is an opportunity to the speakers. Um, this will be done anonymous, so feel free to really put out your questions there. Uh, you'll receive the, the slides used today in recordings later on uh, from my colleague um, and, and other technical issues you might have just right in the, check in the chat box on the right hand side. Um, to start off, uh, just shortly about Sora Plaza. Um, many of you listening uh, will know us, uh, but some might not. Um, we're a company based in the Netherlands and for about 10 years now, our main business is organizing high-level conferences and trade missions over the world, we always say from uh, Chile to China. Uh, and we've done this in over 20 countries at this point. Um, just very short, some of our upcoming events, uh, our solar diesel replacement events, event in Mexico, are at the moment three solar asset management events coming up, and again our event in India this year. Um, and mentioning the solar asset management event, it's uh, the first upcoming in this line. Um, this webinar is a prequel uh, towards it, actually. It's uh, the second time we organize this event in San Francisco. I would say the leading event that is dedicated to the operational phase of PV assets and portfolios, um, topics that are finally uh, getting the deserved recognition. Um, we are planning and expect to have uh, around or over 300 attendees, start of April in San Francisco, uh, and very proud to uh, present more than 40 or 50 high-level speakers there, and also always important to mention um, the leading companies in this field that are uh, supporting the event, either a sponsor or exhibitor. Um, that's very important, of, of course, for us, and uh, that helps us driving these events forward. Um, enough introduction for now. I want to come to the webinar of today. Um, if we talk about managing solar assets and portfolios, we're talking about a quickly evolving landscape, uh, many innovations, uh, consolidating portfolios, so things are happening on the, the secondary market. New investors and asset owners stepping in, either utilities or large funds. Um, and of course, different service providers, different models out there, different propositions, and um, thinking about an interesting uh, topic uh, that we had to come up with to organize this webinar. Uh, as a prequel to the conference, we decided that it would be um, suitable to talk about the selection of a service provider and what kind of things an asset owner and investors comes across, what are different models out there, what are the strengths or weaknesses of these different models, and yeah, just put these together in one webinar and have this discussion. Um, so that's the, the overall topic of today. And that brings me to the, the speakers, of course. I'll briefly introduce them um, before we go to the, to the first presentation. Um, first of all, uh, we'll have Cedric Breau, uh, Managing Director and Founder of Solichamba. He is, um, for me at least, the leading uh, monitoring O&M and asset management expert worldwide in the sense that he has a great overview. Um, he is deeply involved in the publication of several uh, reports on O&M and asset management out there that are also published by Green Tech Media. Um, and he's author of these reports. We'll hear him in uh, just a few minutes. Um, after the presentation of Cedric, we'll have an, a discussion of about half an hour. Uh, with the first panelist, uh, Larry Freeman, Business Development Manager at EDF Renewable Services. Uh, Larry brings uh, to this webinar 19 years of experience in renewable energy O&M, um, and he is now responsible for business development of the uh, Asset Administration O&M division at EDF. 
and he used to be um, regional manager, sort of O&M at EDF. Um, next to Larry, we have Joe, Joe Brotherton, president of Maxion Energy Services. Um, he brings experience in execution of over one gigawatt of solar O&M contracts. Uh, he used to be the technical service team leader at Swinerton Renewable Energy and also the commercial operations manager at Advanced Energy. And completing the uh, discussion later on, uh, next to the other two gentlemen, we have Jamie Mordarski, senior manager O&M for North America at SMA Solar Technologies, one of the leading uh, inverter manufacturers we all know. Uh, Jamie <laughs> seems to be winning here if we talk about uh, the number of years, 21 years experience in um, power generation, field servers, uh, operations and controls in uh, different kinds of energy sources. Um, he is now senior manager at O&M, as I mentioned, has been uh, formerly a field engineering supervisor at SMA, but also a megawatt field service team leader at Fuel Cell Energy. Um, Going back to Cedric, um, Cedric will be presenting, as I mentioned, in the coming uh, about 20 minutes. Uh, he will touch upon with us on the different types of O&M and asset management service providers, so how does this landscape look like. Um, he will also explain about what are the, the major, the main decisions that an investor and owner of assets comes across, and we'll be touching upon the different models, pros and cons there. Um, Cedric, we will be um, having your slides on right now, as I can see, so the word uh, will go to, uh, to you. Let me check if you are uh, unmuted. Can you speak up at the moment? Yes, Stefano. Hi, Cedric. Great. Can you hear me? I can hear you well. Uh, the slides are, are here, are yours and I'll be uh, moving forward or back when you ask me so. Yes, thank you Stefano for the, for the introduction. Let's get into the next slide. So before we start uh, talking about pros and cons and different providers, I wanted to start uh, with the, a few definitions. And here there, there will be different opinions and I talked to a lot of different industry players. Many of them have their own definition of what what O&M is versus what asset management is. Even with Stefano and Solar Plaza, we're going through debates. And the words, the words are changing, the definitions are changing. If you look, um, let's say even 12 months ago, asset management was defined as something very specific. It was, um, it was more on the financial, administrative, and commercial side of, uh, of the business. And then O&M was more technical. There was operations management, and then there was maintenance. Now we're starting to see a shift in how these words are used, and oftentimes people refer to asset management as the whole thing, the whole picture. Um, but the industry hasn't really come up with a name. If you, if you call everything asset management, then how do you call what used to be called asset management, which includes more of the financial, administrative, and commercial aspects? I started hearing this called uh, portfolio management, which I kind of like, um, except that the sometimes it's not a portfolio, it's just a single asset and you still need to manage it. So let's try to get past the words and, and describe what, what these activities are and then we'll have to keep in mind that people, use, people may use these words with different meanings, sometimes meaning asset management uh, as just the green box that you see on the diagram and sometimes meaning that asset management is the whole picture, the whole diagram. Um, so, looking at this, um, at, at this picture, and this diagram is an, is an excerpt of, of the recent report I wrote on the topic of uh, O&M and asset management, you can see that there's a number of activities that are uh, related to money, related to the financial assets. So, uh, it includes things like billing, collections, accounting, everything related to taxes and paperwork, insurance, um, as well as um, legal legal aspects. So all of these formerly called asset management and now maybe in the future called portfolio management. On the right side of the chart you can see uh, that we have O and M that I like to separate in two pieces. I like to say there's the O and there's the M. So the O operations management uh, consists of uh, plant supervision, everything related to monitoring and dispatch of uh, service crews, as well as um, for larger plants, um, the O in operations is a very, has a very specific meaning. 
lightning. It can be um, remote control of the power plant. It could be energy scheduling or forecasting. A lot of uh, advanced functionalities that have to do with uh, interacting with the with the electric grid. Um, there's also back office functions such as performance reporting and warranty management. Although some of these areas are a little bit in between boxes. Um, and I include performance engineering in, in this as well, although this is defined in different ways and, and different providers have different capabilities there. Uh, but what I call performance engineering usually consists of um, advanced analysis, data analysis and trending so you can have a more predictive approach to maintenance and also optimize some of the maintenance operations such as the cleaning schedules. And at the bottom we have the M in maintenance which is a bulk of the cost and that's all, uh, all the activities on site. It includes preventive maintenance, whether it's on the PV plant itself, um, everybody thinks about you know, inverter maintenance and, and um, electrical maintenance, mechanical maintenance, um, visual inspections, etc., transformers for the larger plants, spare parts. Uh, but there's also a maintenance of the PV site itself, such as going and cleaning the modules, managing the vegetation on site, uh, clearing the snow eventually. Uh, it doesn't always make sense, but sometimes it does. Maybe security surveillance, and then a bunch of other stuff, especially for larger utility scale sites. You can have to manage uh, water, uh, waste, roads, fences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So basically, all of this is the picture of O&M and asset management. Um, next slide, please. Takes a couple seconds to refresh. Yes. So when it comes to selecting a provider and first selecting a strategy, are you going to do things in-house or are you going to outsource as an investor or as an owner? Well, the answer is it depends on who you are. And um, I brought together another diagram that comes from my recent report to illustrate um, how you can position different actors and different types of companies um, in the market. Um, so bear with me for a second. This diagram can be a little complicated, but on the, uh, on the horizontal axis, you have financial focus versus technical focus. So on the left side of the chart, you have uh, actors that are a little more uh, financially focused, such as the banks and insurance and uh, pension funds. On the right side of the chart, you have companies uh, that are more technically focused, such as computer manufacturers or EPCs or ONAP firms. And then on the vertical uh, axis, we are measuring um, the interest that the, uh, the length of the interest that these actors have in the PV assets, from short term at the bottom to long term at the top. And so this map gives us an idea of, of where the different actors stand. And when it comes to looking at O&M in particular and asset management as well, uh, the more you're located, the higher you're located in the chart with long-term interest, and the more you're located towards the right-hand side with a technical depth, uh, the more likely you are to benefit from doing things yourself in, when it comes to o and particularly the technical activities. As opposed to uh, if you have more of a short-term interest and you're uh, potentially only a financial uh, financial player, if you look at the bottom left, such as a bank in the case of an asset that may have been repossessed, repossessed that just makes little sense for you to do um, insourcing. And then you have a number of actors that are kind of in the middle area and, and for those um, it's actually, it's actually quite tempting uh, to, to insource. So if we take a look at this picture, we'll see, for example, that an EPC that typically has um, a lot of technical depth, uh, but at the same time, most EPCs only have a short-term interest in the plant during the warranty period, one to five years. So that doesn't necessarily uh, make them uh, perfect candidates for insourcing because they're not even in here for the long term. Um, on the flip side, you can see at the top of the chart a vertically integrated firm, and we'll go through these categories later, um, that are oftentimes signing O&M contracts of 20 years uh, are probably in a good position because they have the technical depth as well as the long-term interest. Same thing for utilities and IPPs that tend to be in there for the long run and have some technical depth. Um, so as you as you try to assess insourcing versus outsourcing, take a look at these two criteria, how technical you are and um, what your um, long-term interest versus short-term interest is in those particular assets, and that should be a guide. And of course, something that is not in this chart, uh, portfolio size. The, the larger the portfolio and the more concentrated it is 
in a particular geographic area, the more it makes sense to consider in sourcing because you may be able to have um, dedicated resources that will be well uh, occupied and, and efficient. Next slide, please. So how many providers do, do you need um, if you're an investor? Or th there are a bunch of different models, and these are only four, and they are quite simplified. But let's take a look at the, the buckets that we had in the previous uh, two slides ago. Um, there's asset management, and there's operations management, and there's maintenance. You could and you can have three separate providers, one that does the financial management, one that does the supervision of the operations, and, and a third one or multiple ones that do the maintenance. The advantage of this approach is that you can select maybe the best, uh, the best players in each of these boxes, and then you have checks and balances at, at each interface point. Uh, the downside of that is, uh, since you're separating the vendors, you're also stacking up margins, so it may be more costly. So there's, you may be able to squeeze more performance out of the asset because you're really optimizing each of the boxes, but then you get an overhead cost of having multiple boxes. The second option that we see underneath is when you have, uh, you combine operations and maintenance, and that's a typical scenario. Um, the, the most often, that's what we see. Asset management is one category that is done by a certain um, uh, vendor or by the investor themselves. And then there's one single contractor uh, or provider that does both operations and maintenance. Potentially subcontracting underneath that, but usually hiding it from, um, from the asset manager's perspective. The third option that we're starting to see is the option where the asset management company um, and sometimes the investor themselves get involved into the operations and swallow the operations um, management box um, and then uh, subcontract the maintenance piece. Uh, it is an interesting option as well because um, that operations box really could, it can be combined either way. It can be combined with asset management or with maintenance. Um, and if the asset management company uh, has strong technical knowledge and depth and has the right infrastructure and tools, they can move into the operations um, the, in the operations box. And then it leaves them interfacing with one or several maintenance contractors that are purely doing on-site activities. And the last scenario is when everything is included in one company. Um, which can be a third-party company, but can be also um, a, an in-house uh, in-house activity. For example, vertically integrated uh, solar firms and certain developers like to do everything in-house from asset management to operations as well as maintenance. Next slide, please. Let's look at service provider categories, and we'll have a little poll uh, in, a, in a minute just to uh, check in the audience today how many of each of these um, categories are represented. I start with the vertically integrated solar firms, the ones that do everything. Uh, so these are the first solar, Sun Edison, Sun Power, Solar City. Um, they, they tend to have everything under one roof. Um, utilities and IPPs, and, I, and you noticed I listed EDF and NRG here. I tend to categorize um, vendors by the activity of the parent company. Um, so you may say, so oftentimes companies like to uh, position themselves as independent o and providers, but they're still part of a project development company or part of an IPP or part of an EPC. Um, so when it comes to categorization, I think it makes more sense to look at what the parent company does. That gives a better uh, idea of, of what that company looks like and what their priorities are. So second category, utilities and IPPs with long-term interests typically. Uh, third one, EPCs and project developers, a number of players out there from, from Gerlicker, UE, Swinerton, many others. Uh, inverter manufacturers, um, I listed a few here. AE, which is not the most active actually. Schneider Electric um, has a very large um, O&M portfolio on a global basis, a little bit less so in North America, but globally large footprint. SMA that's been uh, very active lately, especially in utility scale plants. And actually, as of today, we have a new player in the market, and Phase just announced that they acquired um, the, the company that is in the next, next category below um, Next Phase Energy. So the landscape is shifting right now. There's, there's mergers and acquisitions, and there will be more. So the next category is independent o and providers. I listed a few here. Electris, um, Next Phase was just acquired by Enphase. 
and then Kiwi Solar. And our friends at MaxJet are also part of this category, but they were not listed here because their parent company is SolarUS, which is in the next category. So once again, an, an illustration of uh, the fact that there, there's uh, mergers, there's acquisitions, and there's the lines are sometimes blurred between these categories in the marketplace. And the last category, asset managers, uh, you have companies like Radion Generation, Solaris, that, were, that are traditionally focused on the, on the financial and administrative management of things, but uh, in both cases you see them moving with different, moving with different uh, degrees towards operations and maintenance as well. Um, so now is the time for a poll. I believe, Stefano, you wanted to ask a question to the, uh, to the audience today. Yes, exactly. My colleague is putting up this, uh, this poll, which should be uh, visible in, in a few seconds. Uh, can you see it, Cedric? Yes. Excellent. Um, go ahead. Well, actually, it's, it's rather simple. <laughs> and we had maximum of five um, categories to, to list in. So if all the attendees can, in the coming seconds, um, select anonymously their, uh, their background or what they are part of, that helps us to get an image and possibly unbiased uh, the next polls. Um, in, in the meantime, so while well, we leave this poll open, um, you just mentioned these different categories. Are there any categories that are specifically growing? You just mentioned um, the category of the inverter manufacturers, but um, is there anything you can say about that? Yes, well, there's a, there's a growing number of players in all of the categories. Uh, definitely, we see an emergence of, of independent O&M providers, but we also see more inverter manufacturers getting involved. We see more um, utilities and IPPs having specific um, divisions that do it, and we see more and more EPCs that are, uh, that are trying to pursue O&M as a business. So pretty much every single category in there is, is, getting, is growing. <laughs> Okay, well, that's fair enough. My, uh, we do have the, the results of the, the poll. Shall we look at them directly? Yeah, why not? And I have to look on the other screen to see them. Okay, so we see this is not very unreasonably uh, divided, although the, the largest part is obviously in the, the first group, which um, includes a lot. Um, yes, it, it includes a lot, and actually, it's it's also where the majority of the business goes today in terms of O and M. Uh, the typical, the default choice is the EPC, so that that would make sense. Yeah, great. So it's good to to see. Let's conclude here that we are equally uh, <laughs> divided. Thanks to the attendees to, for uh, for sharing this with us. Um, we will continue with with you, Cedric. I'll put up the the next slide. Mm -hmm. So let's take a look at a few um, selection considerations when it comes to uh, assessing providers. There's a lot of providers out there. Um, an obvious one is, is expertise. You definitely want to make sure that the providers you select has the right skill set, the right staff, the right um, training and, and certifications um, in order to, to be a good uh, provider. You definitely, uh, that's, that's very important. But, also, the second point I want to mention is uh, the importance of the infrastructure and tools. Especially when it comes to large power plants, uh, you want to make sure that the provider has an operation center and is able to, um, to, to perform what is needed um, in the utility scale plants, for example. That may include things like NERC requirements, uh, remotely controlling the plants, doing energy scheduling, energy forecasting. Um, and those are pretty advanced and, and for the largest plants, but even for smaller plants, there are infrastructure tools that are also needed. For example, is there, um, is there a good way to manage um, service tickets? Um, do they have the software tools? Do they have the processes? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So infrastructure is important. It is a service business and, and this takes tools. Another aspect is the scale of the provider and geographical coverage, and both are related because you may look at two providers, maybe two providers that have 50 megawatts. One of them has 50 megawatts that is spread across multiple states. Another one has 50 megawatts in certain specific California areas. Uh, this is a very different profile. What we want to look at is, is the ability of a provider to really have good coverage and good response time and the right staff in a particular geographic area. So uh, scale is important, but it always needs to be tied to, uh, to geographical uh, coverage. 
the ability to perform warranty repairs is oftentimes overlooked. And let me take a quick scenario here to give you an example. Um, if you have a provider that is doing your O&M and um, something goes wrong at the plant, let's say, for example, an inverter. I don't want to beat up on inverters, but that's a common reason for failure. Whether it's the actual cause of failure or not, it's oftentimes the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the presumed culprit. And so um, a technician is sent on site and confirms that actually maybe something is wrong with the inverter. If the system is, if the plant is under warranty and, and that particular O&M provider does not have the, uh, the ability to perform the repair, then they're going to have to call the inverter uh, manufacturer and then the manufacturer um, has to come and, and fix the issue. So you, now you have two parties involved. You have wasted time because you, the first person came and, and saw the issue and then has to call the second person. So this has an impact on, um, on response time and on uh, availability and ultimately performance of the assets. So you may want to check if your providers have the ability to directly perform repairs on some of the key components such as the inverter. Another aspect is the alignment with the, with the owner's interest and the investor's interest. And this is a little hard to measure. Um, it is tricky. It depends on contract structures and it also depends on um, the core business of the company. I'll, I'll take an example here and uh, I'm actually glad there's no EPC on the panel today because I'm not going to be beat up on for, for bringing this point. Um, let's take the example of an EPC or, or a company that has built a plant and um, they have warranties, they have workmanship and they have liabilities if something, um, if they made a mistake, if, they, if there are issues with the plant. And now imagine they have the O&M contract. What happens if there is an issue with the plant that leads to um, discovering problems with the construction that lead to either liability of fixing it or liquidated damages, etc.? If the same party is the EPC and the O&M, you may find that there is a potential conflict of interest there. Finding the problem and reporting it from an O&M standpoint may lead to uh, a pretty bad financial situation for the company as an EPC. So that's just an example. There are others, and I'm not saying I'm not by any means saying that you need to avoid putting the EPC in charge of one end. That's not that at all. But you just need to be careful about how contracts are structured and how the provider is structured as well. How well it is separated between their EPC and ONM activities. Guarantees are also very important, and in a lot of cases, um, it's going to be the, the, the flip side of the coin that I just mentioned before with EPCs. In a lot of cases, EPCs and developers and the people who built the plants are in, the, in a good position to offer guarantees because they know it very well and they built it, so they, they typically offer better guarantees than a third party. The longevity and bankability of the provider is also something to look at, uh, especially if you're signing for long-term contracts. And finally, the track record. This is a service business, so you want to make sure that uh, the company has a track record of uh, making assets perform well and having satisfied customers. Next slide, please. So when we look at each class of providers, and this is another excerpt of the report I wrote on this topic, um, each of the categories of vendors has a number of strengths and weaknesses. And these are generic. Um, don't take those as um, every single EPC has these strengths and weaknesses, but these are typical things to look at when it comes to a particular vendor class. And again, I'm picking on EPCs because they're not on the panel, but also because they are the most frequent provider of O&M. Um, they're the default choice. And that's one of their strengths. They know, typically they know the site well, they know the project, they know everything they, um, about how the system was built. So it puts them in a really strong position um, to, um, to operate it. They also have, most of them have um, a good domain expertise. And also, since they continue to build power plants, they can have leverage on the equipment providers. So if there's need to do a little bit of arm twisting to get things resolved from one of the equipment suppliers, then since they are buyers of equipment, they can do that as well, at least in the US. If you get into markets in Europe where new construction drops, it's a different story. But in the US, you still have strong construction, so um, this is, this is um, a good situation for EPCs. On the flip side, most EPCs have a number of weakness, weaknesses. For example, um, many of them are uh, project companies, and so they don't necessarily have the processes, the infrastructure, and the culture to, for a consistent service. It's a different culture, project culture versus service culture. 
And then there's potential resource conflicts. Imagine the end of a quarter, if the same team is the one doing O&M and, and EPC, then what happens when at the end of the quarter there's a number of plans that need to be completed and then you have older plans under O&M that have issues. Uh, decisions will favor where the money is and the money is new construction. So if it's not clearly separated, that's definitely an issue. And, um, and that's the case overall for O&M business that tends to be given a lower priority in the, uh, in the grand scheme of things for companies that do both EPC and O&M, just because EPC is such a, a larger bucket. Uh, when construction business slow down, slows down, the things change, but we're not there in the U.S. yet. And opportunities and threats, of course, um, EPCs get to leverage their relationships with a number of players, uh, with the developers and investors. Uh, they are the holders of warranty obligations, and they can use that as a way to push O&M. They're also able to play with prices. Uh, the, if they sell a plant and they sell O&M, they can eventually uh, take a lower margin on O&M in, in order to favor the construction business, and, and some of them clearly do that. Um, and finally, they're also able to offer, um, eventually, extensions of warranties. And the threat for them is the possible conflict of, conflict of interest that we talked about and, and the liability debate. It makes them a little vulnerable to the, to the uh, arguments of independent third parties that are coming here and telling owners that, they, uh, that there's a conflict and that being independent is, a, is, is very important in order to work for the best interest of the owner. And they're all, the other vulnerability is uh, if they are primarily EPC companies, if the, mark, the construction market slows down, then the, the viability of the whole company may be at risk. And we've seen that in Europe with a number of EPCs disappearing after the markets in, in uh, some, of the, some of the main European countries slowed down, which raises the question, what's going to happen after 2016? Next slide, please. So I, I was able. I, I tried to present as much as I could in the short amount of time. Of course, there's a lot more to this topic. The conference that Stefano told you about, April 1st and 2nd in San Francisco, is going to be a great resource. Um, also, I published a report um, that you may find useful that has over 250 pages on the topic of O&M uh, for utility scale plants, and I'm preparing a new report on DG for the U.S. So feel free to reach me as well. I offer consulting services and private research, um, and I hope this presentation was useful. It was Cedric. Thanks uh, a lot again for uh, your um, your insights and uh, an overview on this. Um, before we move forward, um, I have two questions from the audience for you. Um, so let's try to answer them uh, briefly. And again, yes. I would like to uh, to encourage um, all people listening to share their questions, and we um, we ask them anonymously. And also, if we at the end don't find time for your question, we will try to connect you to the person. Um, you want to ask. Uh, first question, Sadiq, uh, is uh, during the warranty period, it is common that the O&M performs uh, the warranty repairs. Sorry, that's mainly the question. Because generally you can void the warranty if anyone other than the vendor performs the work. Um, what would you say on this? Yes, there is a risk there, uh, and that's why I was mentioning in my selection criteria the ability to perform warranty repairs, uh, because, uh, and particularly in the case of inverters, there may be issues if a non-approved uh, company or technician is, is basically dealing and, and make, doing things inside the inverter. Uh, that's why it's really important to, um, to consider this aspect and to make sure that, if, uh, that, that the provider you use is authorized to do these things. And um, I would say, uh, and then maybe that's a topic for discussion for the panel, but um, most inverter manufacturers are um, r reluctant to enabling many people to do this, to perform those repairs. And, and part of it, I'm sure, is because inverters are complicated, but maybe part of it also is because more and more inverter manufacturers are interested in doing this business themselves. Yeah, makes sense. Thanks, uh, Cedric. Um, one other question I have here is uh, the slide you showed with expertise to guarantees, the, the, the main considerations mm -hmm. um, that an owner can have regarding uh, choosing the right service provider. Is there any, um, any top, any uh, most important consideration to highlight there in your experience? I mean, you talk with uh, not only service providers, but a lot of different uh, people in this space and also 
so um, asset owners, portfolio owners. Have you experienced that one or two of these are, are really the, the key there? I would say that the track record will tell you a lot. If you find a provider, I mean, scale, track record, and bankability seem like they pop out, but ultimately everything is important. If, you, if any of these points is really weak, um, then you're exposing yourself to risk. Um, but ultimately, as just with a, any service business, if, if, if there's one indicator that can tell you a lot is customer satisfaction and track record. Clear. Uh, thanks. We, if there is any time later, we will um, ask you the other questions, and else we'll try to uh, connect you. Um, stay uh, in the stay in the webinar, and let's uh, move forward to the the discussion now. Yes. Thank you. So, as mentioned before, the, the second part of this webinar is uh, meant to be a discussion and Q and A. Uh, again, with the opportunity for you as attendees to ask questions to these. Uh, different uh, experts. Um, topics we'll be touching upon are, for instance, uh, the combination versus separation of O&M and asset management. You see different things happening in the market, in the market there. Uh, managing spare parts, always a hot topic, uh, and often uh, strategies for this are still not well defined. So who is best positioned or what are scenarios here? And also we want to assess, uh, as Cedric already introduced actually, so the propositions of an EPC, inverter firm providing O&M, uh, what are pot potential strengths and weaknesses here, uh, depending on the point of view and the situation. Um, so I'm uh, going to uh, unmute the um, uh, panelists now, let's see if this works, and I want to start with uh, all the three gentlemen having a, a short introduction, which short I really mean one, one and a half minute uh, on uh, what they work on, uh, what are you managing and what services do you provide so that the people in the audience have a clear uh, view of what, uh, of who is speaking and um, what you are representing. Larry, I've unmuted you, can you hear me and can you, uh, can you start off here? Uh, yes, thank you Stefano. Uh, I wanted to start with uh, one, a thank you to Cedric. That was, uh, I think, a, a great way to start this off. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, absolutely. Go ahead. Perfect. So uh, I think it's a, uh, generally, uh, with EDFRS, with being, uh, as Cedric mentioned, we are fall into the utilities IPP category, uh, and then have our service division within that, re renewable services. Um, we find that uh, the market, different customers, different owners have different requirements, and, and we try to uh, tailor those needs. So in some cases, uh, providing both uh, asset administration, uh, asset management, operations, maintenance services in, in one package works. But the typical structure is that there will be separate contracts for the different phases of the project. So we, you know, that we'll have, for instance, can offer a uh, a standalone asset administration agreement uh, and then a separate O&M agreement and intend to not tie those together. Um, uh, that being said, we can do uh, also availability to uh, provide operations only services, uh, maintenance, uh, and, and really customize it to the needs of the owners, right, because there really are no two projects that are the same. Thank you, Larry, for this short uh, introduction. Um, let's move forward to uh, Joe. Can you do the same <laughs> in the same time, uh, give a short intro, and perhaps you can also react to what Cedric has just presented, but brief. Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me, Stefano. Um, yeah, Cedric brought up a lot of good points, and, and Larry touched on a few that we see ourselves in, in a similar position, uh, given our recent acquisition late last year you know, we're in a position where we could provide all of them, but like Larry said, every project is different. Um, you know, at all levels, definitions of operations versus maintenance depends on the, the ultimate client and what, what their end game is, whether it's short term or long term. Uh, for us, we are only a service provider, so having the ability to be flexible and adapt to whatever it is that our customer is looking for is, is what we focus on in some areas, only providing minimal services, vegetation management, module washing, 
uh, where in other cases we have full asset management to boots on the ground scope of work with varying agreements along those, the financial piece tied to one and what I'll call O&M tied to the other. So we're in a similar position. Every, every project is different, but being able to be flexible is, is key. Great. Thank you. Um, that brings me to uh, Jamie. Can you complete this short, these short introductions uh, in, the, in the same time frame? Jamie, uh, you have yourself muted, I believe, so can you hear us? Yeah. Okay. Yes, I can hear you. <laughs> Sorry great. about that. Go, great. Go ahead. No problem. All right. Thank you, Stefano, for, uh, for, for uh, putting this together. Looks like we're on a, a good start. Um, so, you know, as far as SMA, um, we're in a unique position of being an inverter manufacturer. Um, I think the biggest asset that SMA brings to the table is, um, you know, the length of time that SMA has been around. Um, SMA has the infrastructure in place and, and has that infrastructure been in place for a long time uh, to be able to provide um, all the, the normal and, and high-end uh, activities and, and uh, uh, management involved with doing O&M as well as uh, being the inverter manufacturer and having that engineering and, and depth and capability of our service team uh, to provide all those resources um, you know, with, with the infrastructure we already have. So it was a natural fit for SMA to uh, be involved in O&M, um, you know, from our customers asking the questions and us being able to leverage our uh, current assets and current management structure, being able to uh, uh, bring it online very quickly and, and gain quite a bit of uh, uh, quite a bit of assets in the last year. Um, and I think uh, you know everybody has challenges uh, with the current market that's out there. There's a lot of uh, uh, you know things happening that uh, aren't necessarily good for, for anybody, but uh, I think we're all managing those in a pretty good way, and uh, I think SMA is doing our best to try to make everybody as happy as possible. Great, and that is good to hear, of course. So we, we'll come back to, indeed, the, the un unique position uh, you're having uh, later on. I, I want to continue with uh, you, Jamie, and then we uh, move back to the other gentleman. Um, the first bullet point I, I already showed is the uh, the split or uh, combining O&M versus asset management, uh, you see different things there. We already heard some companies are looking to combine this. Uh, what do you see in terms of this split in the market and how do you expect this to move forward and perhaps do you see that is uh, creating new opportunities for SMA? Well, I think there's definitely new opportunities out there for SMA and as far as you know, all the other O&M providers as well. Um, you know, asset management um, has different terms and, and different owners and uh, financing people and, and customers, um, you know, have their different scenarios on how they want to play this out. Um, I think, you know, it, in many situations, combining the two, um, you know, does help leverage and, and, you know, help manage costs a little bit better. Um, splitting the two out may be a better fit for some customers than others. Um, you know, it just depends on the, on the scenarios, whether you're talking a 150 megawatt PV plant or a, uh, a, 40, me a 40 kilowatt commercial plant. It just depends on the size and the depth that the, the owner or the customer wants to go. Um, I think either way will work. Um, you know, for us it's a unique position where we, we have all those things already in place and, you know, we can bundle them together and make it a uh, a very good proposition for the owners. Thank you, Jamie. Um, moving back to uh, to you, Joe. Uh, let me unmute you. Uh, you already started to to explain this. Uh, let's let's look ahead in, in in five years. Is this a general trend, or what uh, what trend do you expect uh, moving forward from here? Well, you know, I think the the U.S. market. I think there's definitely some questions on, on what happens. Our focus has typically been what I'll call utility scale. Um, you know, I see a trend where there's, there's one, a focus on some M&A in the O&M space, obviously with some news today and, and our news late last year. Um, you know, I see a focus in the, I'll call it the commercial DG O&M space as well, growing. But being that our focus has been utility, uh, we do see a number of players looking to capitalize on some of this rush construction, if you will, especially in the Southwest, uh, more providers coming in, new providers coming in. Uh, we, see, we see the market 
growing. Obviously, Cedric's done a lot of the research and showing what the ONF space is really capable of. But uh, the infrastructure is growing within these organizations. It, it's going to vary between how focused people are on service only type of opportunities versus the combined construction and service opportunity. So obviously we're on the, the service only side and that's what we're going to focus on. Mm -hmm. So in, in five years, is very short, um, do you still see companies offering uh, O or M separately from, from asset management or will it mostly be integrated? Um, I think there's going to be some integration, but being that, in, in our opinion, they're so different. The financial piece is, is a piece where, you know, there really has to be an investment, I think, in, in bringing that piece into what I would say Max generally does in the O&M space. There's going to be some integration, but being that there's 20, 25-year PPAs out there, there's always there's going to be a need for it five years from now for sure. So we definitely think there's still people around that are going to offer it, um, whether it's a JV type of approach uh, in offering combined services or, you know, parent companies with wholly owned subsidiaries that perform all aspects of the the operational value chain, if you will, finance to boots on the ground, uh, that'll do it. Uh, th there is going to be players there five years from now. Okay. Uh, Larry, um, do you see this differently or how do you see this differently? Let's say, let's take the same five-year uh, outlook. Sure. I think that uh, we see an evolution uh, in primarily driven by the, the types of owners and financial players that are making investments in, mm -hmm. uh, in the space, right? Uh, you know, some years ago there were small developers that would then hold Right, and they would go out and seek independent financing, and that would really determine what they were, were looking for in their providers. And we've seen an evolution over the last few years where there are, uh, you know, we'll say private equity funds, uh, hedge funds, uh, other uh, investment vehicles that are, are really see these as attractive prospects, and uh, they from a risk profile for themselves, you know, may seek to uh, look to longer term O&M style agreements, uh, which, which they would really see as an extension of warranty. You know, for instance, uh, uh, piecing it up, right, and, and buying uh, an extended warranty from an inverter manufacturer, right, but then not having the in-house expertise to provide those uh, asset services to project, right, knowing having the technical expertise to properly evaluate and make decisions about what is best in the plant's interest. So I, I think that we're going to still continue to see the individual providers and, and I think uh, there will be uh, independent services also and, and there are going to be uh, in a very fluid manner, there are going to be those, uh, those owners who are looking for a one-stop shop. So we believe it's important to maintain flexible and I guess to you know, refer to that earlier point, right? No two projects and no two owners are the same. So you know, we find that the more we try to put everything in a nice neat little boxes, the more those boxes get get moved around and the edges erased. Okay. Um, coming to or sticking to what you again mentioned, uh, no two projects are the same, no two owners are the same, but also trying to link to the the next topic we want to discuss: spare parts. Um, I bet you've got thousands of questions about this in the last uh, couple of years already. Um, why do you think, uh, as being EDF, and I'm going to ask exactly the same question <laughs> to the other um, uh, panelists, but uh, fact-based, why do you think you are better positioned um, to manage spare parts and other uh, types of service providers? Uh, or perhaps you can be very honest with us and explain in which cases this is not the case. Um, what would you say to this? Sure. So I think uh, one thing that is uh, we believe is, is very helpful in our spare part strategy is that we bring uh, an ownership perspective to it. Right? We we own and operate here in North America about three gigawatts of assets. Right. So we we look at that that value chain that procurement uh, and spare parts managing, uh, management, the, the throughput, the, the times, lead times, costs, 
Uh, and, and we can take that expertise and bring it out to uh, and experience in depth out to third parties, right? You know, so for instance, we can negotiate favorable conditions for parts purchases and then pass those savings on to the owner. Um, where it gets more difficult, you know, we are not well positioned to provide a parts wrap on projects, right? Essentially, at that point when we're, you know, discussing what's going to be failing in in 12 or 15 years from now, uh, which are really unknowns, and then once again there are micro siting uh, grid conditions that that can cause other failures. In many cases, you don't want uh, a service provider, if us or anyone else, to um, necessarily provide that wrap early on because really you're paying uh, your provider to be an insurance company, right? And, and they are going to take you know an appropriate risk hedge on that, right? So um, that being said, right there there are certainly owners who would prefer to to take that variability out of their pro forma and would be perfectly happy to pay say 10 to 15 percent premium. Uh, over the life of the project on parts to know that they're not going to have any variable cost year to year. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. Um, thanks, Larry. Moving back to, uh, to Joe as an, uh, that's an independent service provider, what are your strengths? And, and perhaps you can also share the, the possible weaknesses in uh, the position of managing spare parts. Sure, I, and I, I think it goes back to the, the project uh, itself. When we're involved in a brand new project, our approach might be different than when we're, we're taking over a project that has already been operating for, for some period of time. Um, so I'll take the, the first scenario. Uh, in, in a new project, you know, depending on when you get involved, we've been fortunate enough to be involved on very early in some projects where we're sitting down with EPCs during the design process. Uh, we're sitting down with the owners during their EPC selection uh, phase and, and we help with the strategy. The managing of parts is easy. It's wh what parts do you need, how much do you need, where, where we start to be asked questions. So given our field experience on various technologies, various locations, uh, one strength we bring to the table is our ability to provide data around what issues do we see. Um, so we can track every issue from a you know, stuck tracker to a combiner box that for some reason we always uh, see loose uh, loose connections things of that nature and we can we can tailor a spare part strategy to the location the type of technology uh, the type of installation uh, whereas when we take on a project that has been operating you know we in some cases get handed a, a strategy that was decided a number of years ago and the project has changed hands a number of times in which case we, we like to perform our own evaluation and then we either come up with a new strategy or just tailor the one that's been there uh, in, in order to help, help I guess, create a new way that the, the site can operate efficiently. Our ultimate goal is to reduce downtime, more money in the pocket of our clients. So, you know, that's, that's really where the strength lies, the weakness. We don't have the negotiating power uh, of some other groups when it comes to straight components. Uh, purchasing uh, because that's that's not our business uh, but in that case we we have many partnerships and relationships uh, with inverter manufacturers I know that was something that came up earlier uh, where we're almost an extent a service arm extension of some of these inverter manufacturers where we eliminate their need to build infrastructure and hire resources in regions where we're already located we have a partnership there where you know we can manage their inventory for them uh, on on major components. We do that with both inverters and trackers. Fair enough. Okay. Um, coming back to uh, to Jamie, and I think um, of course knowing the the high impact of inverters on on plant functioning and about knowing what issues are to be seen, um, an inverter manufacturer itself has a, a very strong call in being responsible for this. But how would you answer? Um, this question, Jane, what are the, your, your strengths and still potential weaknesses in this case? I think, uh, yeah, obviously being an inverter manufacturer, um, you know, we're in a unique position where we, we have the infrastructure um, already in place. Um, you know, we already have the, the, the purchasing power, we have the service logistics 
Um, we have all the, the back uh, SAP, CRM, et cetera, systems in place to, to manage all the parts that are necessary. Um, we're already doing it with the inverters. Um, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, we do our own service. SMA doesn't, doesn't um, uh, contract or allow others to do perform uh, repairs on uh, SMA equipment. So we're seeing um, what the trend is as far as uh, problems in the field. Um, you know, as was mentioned before, a lot of times the, the first call that an owner or a service provider will make will be to the inverter manufacturer to try to help them uh, figure out what's going on uh, with the system. And, you know, with that, um, you know, with, with the minimum amount of troubleshooting a lot of times it's done, uh, we have a very good in-depth analysis and understanding of the, the common problems that are out there. And we have to, you know, usually work with those customers. and. A lot of times they're asking us to provide, uh, um, you know, technical information and, and resources for uh, components and parts outside of the scope of the inverter. Um, so I think, you know, being in the position that we are a very unique one uh, compared to a lot of, uh, a lot of other providers, um, you know, we have the experience and the knowledge and uh, able to handle uh, spare parts and, and asset management uh, quite well. Okay, let's uh, ask the audience, I would say, uh, so uh, thanks Jamie, but let's see what all the attendees uh, think. We have one poll about this as well, and of course, as I mentioned, um, spare parts is a, is a specific topic and needs specific strategy, which also depends on the case, that is true. Uh, but if you can just give your uh, opinion anonymously as a listener to the, um, to the webinar, that would be great. You'll have... Um, some seconds now in, in the coming, let's say 10 more seconds, and then we can continue this discussion, but I'm quite curious for this. Uh, so please go, uh, go ahead. Um, I wanted to uh, check with Cedric in the, in the meantime. I have um, one question for you, Cedric, in order to uh, fill up these, uh, these few seconds. Um, yes. Are you there? Can you hear me? Excellent. The question yes. is, would independent O&M groups, uh, providers, accept guarantees and or liabilities like an EPC would? Um, what have you seen and or is there, a, is there one answer to this? The answer is no, not like an EPC would. Um, and that makes sense because um, the EPCs, they built the plant, they procured the equipment and they made uh, a lot of margin. Um, on, or at least some margin in, uh, in, in this process. So they're willing to take on more guarantees and more liability related to those as opposed to a pure play or, or a third party who didn't build the plant. Um, if they take on limited, liquidated damages risks, um, it can only be within proportion of the revenue that is attached to O&M as opposed to an EPC plus O&M that can take liabilities over the total value of the contract which is much larger. So um, although we do see more and more uh, third party providers take on more, uh, more liability and more guarantees, it, it, it will not be to the same extent as the people who built the plant. Okay, well, um, thanks for, for answering this question, by the way. Um, let's take a look at the uh, results of the, um, the poll. Trying to see. There you go. So here we see a very high, well, of course, this is a, a limited um, uh, pool of people, but um, very strong preference for the independent O&M, followed by a preference for the inverter manufacturer and the, the EPC or the integrated firm. What, what are your first thoughts if you look at this? Well, I say that the opinions are split, but um, when it comes to my own opinion, I would say that the, um, it depends on locations. Um, if, you have, if you have a specific geographic area where, let's say, EDF has a number of plants and they can actually be efficient because they can share uh, spare parts across a variety of plants, they, they may be the best. And maybe there's another region where SMA has big density and they can be the best one. And there's another area where the independents are best. So I would say it's not necessarily a one-size-fits-all answer. Overall, I tend to think that the inverter um, manufacturers are well positioned, uh, just because they. I mean, if there's a if there's a number of, of sites that use their own inverters, then they're um, they they probably have a better density. Uh, but on the flip side, for people who had contracts with Satcon, we can see that it's not always a winning solution. Yeah, thanks for uh, for commenting on this, uh, Cedric. 
Um, back to uh, Jamie. Um, so uh, we we heard the presentation of Cedric and also the um, uh, the thoughts around, for instance, doing the EPC, uh, taking care of the O and M, um, and the same or similar questions can be can be asked, of course, about uh, service or inverter manufacturers taking this up. Uh, but it makes a lot of sense, I would say, if you look also at one of the graphs Cedric. Um, uh, shared. So the inverted manufacturer is therefore the long-term uh, high-level technical knowledge. Um, so um, it seems a great match. Um, what, what kind of, um, so if we don't talk just about spare parts, um, but um, also about, let's say, O&M in general, what do you? What are the questions you get and how would you address this, uh, pot these potential questions? Uh, the potential questions about um, about O and M directly, or yeah, about the inverter manufacturer being responsible for for O and M, just as the, the the potential concerns or questions, strengths and weaknesses that Cedric raised for an EPC. Yeah, I, I think um, you know the biggest thing, like you said, and like we saw on the slides, was was the long term, um, you know, the long term ability of an inverter manufacturer um, to you know be in the market. And have the experience and the knowledge. Um, obviously, you know there's different inverter manufacturers, and, and they've been around for different lengths of time. Uh, it really depends on the depth. Um, you know, a lot of the questions we have are, you know, why why would an inverter manufacturer want to do O and M? I mean, you build inverters. Um, you know, what do you what do you see and what do you bring to the table as far as an inverter manufacturer that somebody who just does O and M and nothing else bring to the table? Well, you know, it, it's the depth of knowledge. Um, it's the layers of, of, of people, um, hundreds of engineers, uh, direct contact with a customer, um, you know, trends over, over different types of uh, plants from your residential all the way up to your uh, commercial, industrial, and utility applications. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, w once people start looking at it and, you know, like I said, it depends on the inverter manufacturer, it depends on, you know, the, the O&M provider, but, um, you know, our unique position allows us to to go that extra mile and, and have those extra assets and resources available um, to do the things that many people just just can't. Um, to go to have those extra engineering resources, uh, specialized tools and equipment. Um, you know, be able to uh, easily perform the preventive maintenance that's required on the equipment. Um, you know, that's the one big thing that we see is a, is a huge problem out there right now is a you know, lack of preventive maintenance and you know obviously when SMA is doing preventive maintenance and O&M on our own equipment um, you know things are going to happen the way they should be and, and you know, the warranties are going to be maintained properly and I think that's you know that, that's a big thing to look at and to understand. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, thanks Jamie. I want to move back to uh, Joe. Um, also regarding the, the outcome of the polls you also wanted to react to this. Yeah, you know, I think uh, Cedric brought up a couple good points uh, in that question of around guarantees and and if O and M providers uh, would be independent O and M providers would be willing to to sign up to it. One, you know, seeing the results of the poll and in managing spare parts, you know, I, yes, it's a limited sample set, but I guess I took a, a different opinion than what Cedric said because in the case of Maxion, we'd be willing to, but uh, all I'll qualify that by saying it, it depends on the project and who our partners are. We have, you know, there's a number of ways to provide guarantees. Ultimately, someone's paying for it one way or the other, and it's up to the group providing the guarantee to, to decide where that allocation of, of money goes to provide the guarantee. So whether it's partnering with an EPC to say the independent O&M provider is going to be doing all the warranty work, everything's taken care of, um, the the ultimate client, you know, from from our experience, they don't care who's doing it. Ultimately, they want a next number of megawatt hours, or just an availability guarantee, or just a performance ratio guarantee. I don't think there's really a standard on what type of guarantee people are looking for yet. That's one thing that everyone's opinion, uh, higher up the food chain, financiers, uh, owners, or peer developers, you know, they all have their own opinion. But as a service provider, you know we can be flexible and provide any of them uh, with the proper amount of of 
upfront due diligence um, and involvement early on in the process. So I would say that there are some independent O&M providers willing to take on the risk and liability and liquidated damages uh, as long as the circumstances are set correctly. O&M is starting to no longer be the last box that needs to be checked before a project gets turned on. We're being asked to be involved very early on in the process. So I think that the industry is learning that the long-term O&M cost really is more, uh, more of a factor in the pro forma than maybe people would have said it was a year ago. Um, in, in talking with banks, it's no longer just that sell in an Excel spreadsheet that people are looking to plug in a number. They, they see that there's some variability. So having a good strategy, having guarantees in place from someone who can be flexible is something that I, I think is starting to be talked about. So in the case of taking on the risk, yes, I think there are people who'd be willing to do it uh, just in the independent O&M phase. Thank you, Joe. I want to move back to uh, to Larry. Do you have any uh, different thoughts on on this from your perspective, Larry? And also, uh, the question I, I raised uh, regarding the potential uh, questions around an EPC inverter uh, manufacturer providing O and M. What are your experiences with this? Uh, yeah, I, I think that it really has to do with the the time horizons you're you're looking at. Right, uh, as well as some of the, uh, as Cedric, I believe, rightly pointed out, uh, the footprint of what you're able to provide. Right, you know, it is, uh, O&M is, is really a, a pretty small margin business, right? You know, the, the largest part of what you're spending and in, in doing on it is bodies, right? You know, someone has to go out and actually use the meter, change the parts, do the thing. And uh, that's... That's a, a key driver there. So in, in some cases, you know, they're, uh, what is the right answer, right? You know, it, it can make absolute sense if you have a plant in Northern California that is, you know, literally within an hour's drive, SMA could very well be your best option uh, for that O&M. Um, and then we start getting into, you know, further on the, the risk, who holds the guarantees when they go, uh, you know, the real trick is, is who is, appropriately positioned to, uh, you know, to accept that. Uh, so typically, you know, an answer that, you know, unless there is going to be a profit sharing agreement, right, on, say, performance guarantee for a plant with your o and provider, if the owner is willing to do that, then maybe that makes sense. But, but in other cases where, uh, you know, you want liquidated damages, uh, you know, the, the profit margin on a project for uh, an o and provider can be far less, even over a five-year term, than what liquidated damages could come up to in events that are truly beyond your control. So uh, I think tailoring those, um, that risk profile on guarantee to the overall project deal uh, is probably the most important thing. Okay. Um, thank you, Larry. I have one more question from the audience I want to uh, to deal with, and so I would like a short answer from all the the three of you, starting with you. Uh, the question is: Different states have different requirements for electrical service. Um, how do you see field techni technician certification um, for nationwide coverage, and what challenges does this bring? Can you comment on this? Sure. So on nationwide coverage. The, the states are separate, but you know, we believe that the governing body is going to be OSHA, right? So, um, you know, electricians aren't necessarily, right, have a license. Electricians are necessary for doing technical service, right, because that expertise is more towards designing, you know, circuits, making sure things are laid out and follow the code, whereas repairers in O&M are really more concerned about, you know, a one-for-one -one replacement of what you're doing. You know, in fact, most O&M, uh, uh, contracts will will actually prohibit an O and M provider from making any changes to the plan. So really, you know, the concern then from this perspective, uh, uh, you know, becomes what does OSHA say, right? And unfortunately, many of those um, many of the requirements from them are are intentionally vague, right? You know, qualified 
properly trained and competent workers, right? And then, you know, what it makes a competent worker is really left up to the employer to decide. So from a national perspective, you know, yes, there are certainly cases where, you know, in market A, you may be required to have a, you know, a licensed electrician performing work. And in that case, that, that's, just, uh, that's just a factor that, that goes into the price for the services. And then you just need to hire the right people with uh, the appropriate credentials. Okay, thanks Larry. Um, Joe, let's come to you. Do, do I need to rephrase the question or can you comment on this or if you totally agree with Larry, you can also say that, of course. Uh, in, in most, in, in some of the ways, yes, I agree with Larry. Our, our approach, you know, many of our contracts, you know, you will get a, a vague requirement that says must comply with, you know, all government requirements or state requirements, mm -hmm. whatever the case may be. And there's there's requirements now, you know, we're, we're a growing industry and solar is becoming a, a space where there's specific rules and regulations put in. So while OSHA is definitely governing all of our nationwide presence, you take California, for instance, where they require a specific certification to do photovoltaic maintenance. Um, so our approach, uh, again, we're, we're a service only provider. We make sure we comply with all of that, getting the specific licenses, uh, that are required using licensed electricians where required, uh, both from a safety standpoint, you know, it's always the what if factor. If something happens to happen, the first question is going to be what kind of training and certification did this person have? Uh, so we want to make sure, one, we comply with that. We obviously want all of our personnel to be going home safe on a daily basis, but, you know, we're very up to date on what the requirements are in the various regions that, that we serve. You know, California, Arizona, and Nevada have specific solar maintenance requirements, so we comply with those on top of just the fact that we have licensed electricians and or technicians that are certified in the, the components that they're working on through the manufacturer. Okay. Brings, that brings me to you, Jamie. Um, how do you see a nation, nationwide coverage if you talk about field technicians? Technician yeah. certification. Yeah, I, I definitely you know agree with both of the perspectives. Um, you know, it, it's it's very hard to get a national certification um, to cover all the facets of O and M. Um, you know, O and M starts you know from the panel level all the way up to the cleaners and the inverters and the switch gear and the communications. I think. You know, every state is different. Like like everybody's saying, every state is different. Um, there may be jurisdictions within certain states that are different. I think more. I, I think a better approach may be uh, a certification for the the company providing the O and M. Um, you know, to understand what their depth is and, and what their capabilities are. Um, you know, the, every every place you go, you're going to have to have different certifications for the individuals doing the the specified work. Uh, but I think a more general approach where the O&M provider has a, a certain uh, certification or a certain, um, you know, understanding of what, what has to happen and what's getting done, is, it may be a better approach to look at uh, to ensure that it's not just the people on the ground are able to handle the problems, but maybe the people in the background, uh, in the office, um, you know, with, with a different, different scope and depth. Okay. Um... Cedric, I was wondering if you have any um, any question you would still want to ask to the the three gentlemen in order to uh, to wrap up. I'm looking for the right way to do this. <laughs> I have one. Uh, who wants to take bets on on what the next merger and acquisition move is going to be like? <laughs> Interesting, Jamie. Um. Yeah, that, that's a good one. Uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of there's there's a lot of uh, a lot of movement going around. You know, there's a lot of contraction. Um, you know, I think I think anybody's guess is as good as the next person. Uh, you know, it's just everything's so fluid right now. Um, you know, look what happened in New Jersey a couple of years ago. There was you know there was 80, 80 90 different installers installing PV plants, uh, and then everything went away. And now there's you know forty different. O&M providers in New Jersey and half of them went away after the first year. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's just so many things going on. I, I wouldn't even propose to uh, try to predict what's going to happen with, with a lot of the different things going on. Yeah. You, you have to place a bet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, and, yeah, and, you know, the odds are going to be pretty, uh, 
uh, pretty weighted against you. It's just, just, you know, there's so many things going on. It'd be very, very difficult to, you know, try to guess. Okay, let's see. Uh, Joe, you're a gambler, uh, or what do you think? <laughs> Can you uh, well, share I, your thoughts? I live in Las Vegas, so I guess that means I'm a gambler. <laughs> um, you know, I think this this whole yield co uh, formation is interesting. You know, seeing the news net last week of Canadian Solar, um, you know, other acquisitions. I think this this yield co play is going to be interesting, and you know, being that this is a service provider call, I. I I'd, I'd probably place a bet that um, you know one of these yield codes that forms also is is going to form some sort of service organization or arm within the yield code. Obviously, protecting the the long term uh, investment that the yield code is already putting out there, uh, being able to do it somewhat in house. Uh, if I had to put money on something, that's that's where I'd go. Okay, interesting. Let's see, um, Larry, what uh, what would you say? You have yourself muted, Larry. We cannot hear. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, so yeah, if I were to put gambling on it, I uh, put a few dollars out there. I, I think that we're going to continue to see some small providers uh, who are going to fail simply because of uh, because of the once again the tight margins, right? You know, the unforeseen taking on too much risk by service providers, mm -hmm. and, and I think we're going to continue to see these uh, and some of the smaller providers be bought up. Uh, you know, by larger groups, which you know are essentially buying a little bit of expertise and uh, and buying some contracts. I think that's where we're going to see it more so. Uh, you know, and they'll be pretty quiet, right? It's not going to be the blockbusters. Uh, as reference, Canadian Solar buying recurrent, and do they decide to uh, you know self perform or, or start a service arm? I think mm -hmm. you know it'll be the little ones that are collectively going to have the biggest impact on the industry. Let's see. It uh, remains a bad but thanks for uh, for sharing this with us. Um, as I said, I'm uh, looking for the right way to uh, round off with this. Um, I, these are all topics that we will be discussing start of April in San Francisco, of course, at Solar Asset Management North America. You will also be able to meet the, the four gentlemen there. Um, Cedric, Jamie, Joe, Larry, uh, thanks a lot for, for joining us and uh, sharing your uh, your vision, your opinion on uh, on all these uh, topics and questions. Um, we will definitely discuss this further together. I look forward to uh, to meet you in uh, in some weeks. Um, I also uh, look forward to possibly meet uh, the attendees of this webinar at the event in the in the U.S. Any questions? Feel free to get in touch with us. I hope you have enjoyed this and it has been uh, useful. If you have any questions or you want to get in touch with uh, the experts you've heard uh, today please uh, reach out by email. You will receive the, the recordings and slides of this webinar. Um, and we look forward to hear from you and, and help you get in touch with, uh, with the, these experts. I wish you a great uh, day ahead or, or evening, depending on where you are, and look forward to uh, meet you virtually in the next webinar at one of our events.